question is, what makes people happy? Christine Carter is not an elementary school teacher. She's a sociologist at UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center. She's giving the students at Havens Junior Elementary School a lesson in a new subject, one that is finally getting some attention from grade schools on up to research universities, the study of happiness. I think that there has been a long-fueled notion in our, in our culture, in our society, that happiness is fluffy, that it isn't something that is, um, is important. It's certainly some, not something that um, the most intelligent among us necessarily need or even want. Carter has set out to change that. Armed with the results of a wide range of recent studies, Carter visits schools, gives parenting classes, has written a book, and publishes a blog all about the benefits of raising happy children. What we know now is that if what we want is for our children to be high achievers, to be good learners, if we want what we want for ourselves is to be successful in life, one of the best things that we can do is to focus on our emotional well-being. Our next guest says you can actually teach your Carter coaches families to practice the habits that lead to more happiness, like showing gratitude. It's now known that gratitude is a skill that can be learned with practice, and those people who do it report feeling happier. Let's push in chairs and come back to the rug, please. I think what she does is really important. I think that when you feel good in your environment, when you feel happy, when you feel confident, and you like coming to school, then you're going to be able to take risks, you're going to be able to try to learn new things, and that's, that's how you do go further in education. For decades, psychologists tended to focus on studying our negative emotions, like fear, anger, and greed. But increasingly, over the last decade, they've turned instead to our positive emotions, examining our capacity for compassion, gratitude, and trust. They call it the science of happiness, and it's blossoming here at UC Berkeley. We have gotten interested in these concepts, right? We've gotten interested in um, compassion or gratitude. You know, only eight or nine years ago, there was one study of gratitude in the scientific literature. You know, thousands of studies of anger, one of gratitude. Dr. Keltner is a psychology professor leading research on emotion and social interaction. He says that science now has the technology for a much closer look into the brain and nervous system, allowing scientists to put to the test some of our oldest scientific notions. There is this long-standing assumption that it really, in terms of evolution, it really is survival of the fittest. And it's important to know that wasn't Darwin who said that, but somebody who came after Darwin named Herbert Spencer. Um, what Darwin said in Descent of Man is sympathy is our strongest instinct, um, which when I read that, uh, I was floored. In a variety of studies covering mental, physical, and social responses to situations, Keltner and others have found that our bodies are built to care, to be sympathetic. They found that a smile or a compassionate touch releases certain stress-reducing hormones, both in the person giving the smile or touch and in the recipient. Brian looks inside. Looking at happiness, Keltner found that the more successful NBA teams were those whose players expressed more social touching as a show of camaraderie. He also did a long-term study showing those people who smiled more positively in their high school yearbooks had a higher level of emotional well-being, 30 years down the line. I'm going to be putting these on um, two of your fingers. Jenny Steller works with Keltner on their latest research, studying participants' reactions to a sad video. They look at the subject's heart rate and breathing when the person is relaxed, then again when the person watches a neutral video not meant to evoke emotion. Then the subject watches a video about children with cancer. One would assume that participants' heart rates would go up because watching young cancer patients would be stressful. That's actually kind of the opposite of what we found. So when individuals are watching this compassion-inducing video, this sad video, uh, we actually see that their heart rate goes down. Um, and what we think that that may be signaling is that the body is calming itself, surprisingly, but it's doing that to prepare to engage in a very peaceful manner, maybe to soothe or to help somebody. These new studies are discovering that the age-old golden rule, treat others as you would want to be treated, is actually part of our genetic makeup, and it may be the answer to our survival as a species. Do sympathetic people 
uh, do better in the game of reproduction. Turns out they are more attractive as mates. Sympathetic parents have kids who are more resilient and who thrive more. Do sympathetic people do better in competitive situations with strangers? And we're starting to marshal data that show kind people fare pretty well and evoke a lot of trust in others. In another Berkeley experiment, researchers are seeking answers to overcoming prejudice. So now I'm going to have you take a saliva sample. They put two strangers of different races together in a room. They first measured their level of the hormone cortisol, which is elevated when a person is under stress. They're given increasingly personal questions to ask each other, okay, to compel so them to get to know each other better. James, how do you feel? After the last meeting in which they play a game, their cortisol levels are tested again. The study showed that cortisol levels dropped significantly, as low as the control group of same race pairs. Rudy Mendoza Denton designed the study. I expected those anxiety effects and those awkwardnesses that happen in, in those initial interactions to persist for a long time, but those barriers came down pretty quickly. Oh, and we were really happy to see that. I think one of the primary lessons to learn is that cross-race friendship can be good for your health. Psychology professor Rob Willer studies why people do come together at all. Why do we cooperate? Why are we not just out for ourselves? If we continue to portray individuals as purely selfish, then we'll create more selfishness than is necessary. Um, but also, I think we want to understand why it is that we do behave in a compassionate and empathetic way so that we can create contexts and systems that support that. In one study using computer games, he told participants that they have a certain amount of money they can invest in a fund with other people. If they invested in the fund, the fund would be increased and divided equally amongst all the participants. Or they could keep the money for themselves. When people do overcome the temptation of self-interest and uh, instead help others, cooperate with others, they're respected more in their group. And then upon receiving that respect, they then help others even more. Willer and the others studying the science of happiness believe their positive results can help rewrite the prescription for a happier society. From UC Berkeley, this is Roxanne Makashjian.